my name is Charlie Lineweaver, and I'll be talking about this. And there are a couple of papers that I'll be mentioning during the talk, and they're here for your reference. So uh, here's a plot as a cosmologist. I call myself a cosmobiologist, and we cosmobiologists have the right to make the history of the universe on one slide. Here it is, the Big Bang, hydrogen, helium, stars. Big stars go boom, produce these elements. Those elements produce planets. Somehow life gets started. And then we ask our biological friends, how life evolved from then. So remember, biologists have to work from here down and try to figure out what happened here. We cosmologists and astrophysicists, we work down here. We're a hard scientist, so we work from here to there, and then we're all confused when it gets here, and that's one of the big problems, how life got started. We want to know that because we want to figure out how often life has gotten started elsewhere. So the big history of the universe is astronomy and then cosmic evolution, and then you have biologists. All right, so another way to look at this is a short movie. Four and a half billion years ago, this is what the sun looked like, and then today we have this. And this is not only funny, but it's also true. And the question is, has this happened elsewhere? So there it is, I'll, I'll play it again. There, there, it's a very short movie. So hydrogen turns into Chan. And this has happened here on Earth, and we're trying to figure out whether this is somehow a generic thing, or is it somehow very, very contingent? and we're not quite sure. Now, one of the pieces of most important progress that has been made is with planets. And so here's this plot. You may have seen different versions of this. This is a period, orbital period. Here's the mass in terms of Jupiter. Here's Earth, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And these, there are different types, there are different ways of detecting exoplanets. These are all exoplanets, except, of course, for our solar system. Somewhere in this green area, you could call them roughly Earth-like, and here's kind of like Jupiter-like. And radial velocities are these blue points here, and you can see there are a lot of planets over here, there are not many over here, and that is a selection effect. I fully expect to have lots and lots of planets in here, and not only do I fully expect that this is 2012, 2015, see how the, this cloud of Kepler points has moved over in this direction. The fact that there aren't many here is not because they don't exist, because that's where Kepler has a hard time finding them. I should mention that if you have any questions, just call out and maybe we can have questions during my talk instead of at the end. Any questions? No, no, I'm not done, but do you have a question? I just like to encourage questions, because I like to interrupt people, so I thought that I'd give the right to other people. Anyway, this is a wonderful plot. We've made lots of progress. One way to summarize that progress is that, now, one thing about scientists, particularly people who do planetary scientists, is they confuse at least with an estimate. So for the past 20 years, we've had lower limits on the percentage of stars with planets. 1995, the lower limit was, well, maybe it's zero, maybe it's 100%. We didn't know. And then we had, oh, at least five. This was often reported as, hey, 5% of stars have planets. It was silly, it was wrong, it's at least 5%. That's why these arrows go from here all the way to the top. And if you follow the progress of these arrows, you'll see that they go up and up and up. And now in 2015-16, we're pretty sure that every star has some type of planetary system. What that diversity is and how diverse it is is another issue, but every planet, every star seems to have some planetary system. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, well, it depends on which mass star you're talking about, but these are mostly, when, pe when planet hunters go hunting for planets, they try to exclude those binary stars, so I suspect that's the, it's not much of a big difference because in a binary star you have very tight circumprimary, very tight circumbinary, circum secondaries, and then also circumbinaries, and then in between you don't, don't have much because the stars interrupt the orbits there. So I don't think that's an important question. I, <laughs> you could ask. <laughs> okay. no, <laughs> Charlie, you you're, you're, Charlie, you're absolutely right. Um, when it comes to circumbinary planets, that also applies to it because the planet doesn't care what is at the center. It is one star or two star. But as you as you very well said. When it is within circumstellar or circumsecondary, there is a lot going on, and, and it's an entirely different story, and uh, um, I agree with okay. you. Okay, oh, well, uh, glad. Thank you. Okay, so, um, so we should be proud. We planetary people, we plan you know, the astro and astrobiology have made lots and lots of progress, and there it is. That's incredible. And the biologists, however, you know, they haven't made that much progress. Carlos, you need to work harder, because you can't... Anyway, so... 
when, if you look at, I'm sorry, at this plot, notice that you have period here, and for each of these planets, we know the host star. Because we know the host star and its period, we can tell what the effective temperature on that planet is. When you do that, so you replace the period with a temperature, here's what you get. Here's planetary temperature, effective temperature, and mass in Earth masses now. And here's something that is painted green because that's supposed to represent the habitable zone. And you can see what kind of planets we have detected so far. And there aren't that many around here, but I should say that this is from 2012. 2015, you will find a few more scattered here because that red cloud has essentially come down in that direction. Not as far as we'd like, but yes, yes, Nader. This is beautiful. Now, here is the thing. When you say planet, uh, you're talking about the temperature on the surface of the planet? Is that what I'm you're talking saying? About, no, I'm talking about the calculation of the effective temperature. Of course, now, now, if you look at this, this is in the 2012 annual review paper, and what you're bringing, an important point is to realize, here's the effective temperature of the Earth, and then the real temperature is from here all the way to here. Venus, the effective temperature is right here, but the real temperature is here. So it doesn't really include atmosphere. Atmosphere is very complicated, and so, yes, you're right. That's what my point. Okay, Thank so you. remember, when you're talking about habitable zone, it's very important how big an atmosphere you have. If you have a big, thick atmosphere, boom, you're moved all the way over here in this plot. Now, the question is, these are big things, and so they probably have massive atmospheres, so they are probably, boom, pushed over here. So if you really want to correct for that in some way, you might want to take these guys and push them over here, and these guys and push me even further, and these guys push me even further. But we don't know how to do that very well. <laughs> Okay. okay, I did. I did. What you say is not true. The habitable zone is defined accounting, taking into account the possibility of atmosphere. So the habitable zone is the zone outside which we consider it is impossible, whatever atmosphere you have, to have liquid water on the surface. On the surface. We'll talk about that more another day. Oak. <laughs> It all depends on the chemical structure of the atmosphere and also, of course, the thickness of the atmosphere. But no, what you're saying is too general to be scientifically valid. Okay, let me interrupt there. This is my talk. You guys sit down. <laughs> I ask for questions, not comments. For the Okay, so, so one thing is to make a cake, you need flour. Well, I think you can agree with that. And uh, to make an earth, you need some metals. And let me remind you that as an astronomer, we don't use this periodic table, we use this one. And that's what we mean by metals, but more specifically, but more specifically when we say metals, we use iron, it's right here, right? That's what we use, F-E on H usually. So metals are there and then iron. So this is a complicated plot, but basically the x-axis here is time. Now, this was made in 2001, so the age of the universe back then was 13.4, so it's gotten 400 million years older since 2001. But forget that detail. Big Bang over here, here's the, today. Here's where the Sun and Earth formed, right here, Sun forms. Here for you astronomers, we have cosmologists, we have redshift up here. For what redshift? Sun formed at redshift of 0.5. Now, so that's 4.567 billion years ago. Now, we cosmologists can figure out what the star formation rate, we can approximate the star formation rate in the universe. It's called the Madau diagram, the star formation. And so over here we have star formation rate. That's number of stars per year per megaparsec cube. That's a big region of the universe. And uh, so we know that the star formation rate as we go back in time increased, 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 and then it had to dip. So we have this type of distribution of stars. And from the previous... Uh, plots I've showed you, we can assume that, uh, uh, cosmic default, that every one of those has some type of planetary system. Except, if you're interested in Earth's, you need some rocks. Rocks are not there in the beginning. Now here's F-E on H, here's the, an estimate of the metallicity increase in the universe. It's kind of like the garbage in a neighborhood if you don't take, if no, the garbage truck doesn't come along. And that is the garbage in the universe is just piling up, piling up, piling up, piling up, piling up. So you're getting more and more and more iron. As hydrogen turns into helium, helium turns into et cetera, et cetera. So that is a monotonic increase. And then I've made an assumption that to have an Earth-like planet, 
you need this type of metallicity. You can't make an Earth-like planet if you have one thousandth the metallicity of the sun, and that's down here. Or even one hundredth, we say, oh, you start to make Earth-like planets at one tenth. That's an approximation, but that's what's been used here. So the whole point is the metallicity of the universe has to come up to about this level before you start making Earths. Now what that means is that if this is the stellar distribution, if this, this plot here is the star formation rate, this would be the Earth formation rate, except for the fact that these stars don't have metals around them. So you can't make Earths. So you cut off a little bit, and then you are left with the age distribution of Earths in the universe. And when you do that, you can see that we are kind of, kind of young. The two-thirds are over here, and about one-third over here. And this plot is the basis of why Stephen Hawking thinks we should keep our heads down, because uh, there has been plenty of time for life to have evolved elsewhere. The mean of this distribution is about two billion years older than ours, and so if we meet these advanced civilizations, they will be, on average, two billion years more advanced. And if you want to know what that means in terms of biology, you can ask Carlos over here. And Howard, you have a comment? Yeah, I do. That's because Hawking assumes evolution uh, and survival of the fittest. So we agree with that. But it would seem to me he forgets that if we last past 100 more years or 1,000 more years, I believe we will have learned how to live with ourselves and be peaceful. I don't think we would last for a billion years if we were warlike. So I welcome visitors from a Z of eight. That was not a comment, Howard. <laughs> OK. I mean, that was not a question. Sorry. <laughs> OK. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We'll talk about that. That's something over coffee. OK. So that. This is data, and so we have an approximate. Now, I should point out for full disclosure that the re this ch has changed since 2001, and so we have a peak here about one to two rather than four in this diagram. Okay, so when, this, when I published this, there was a report of a new scientist, hey, our planet is young, and then somebody, this newspaper says, hey, we now know why ET uh, won't talk to us because we're too immature. The aliens are two billion years more advanced, and so they don't want to talk to amoebas comparatively. All right, so in the last few decades, you have, with uh, terrestrial environments known to harbor life, this is what these extremophile scientists are doing, and they're finding, hey, their life seems to be in all these incredible environments. And then the planetary scientists are finding all kinds of planets, so this is getting bigger and bigger. The hope is that somehow these will overlap in a, in a habitable region somewhere. And uh, these increases, hey, it's, life can live in hotter and colder, more acidic, more basic, more high or low acidity, salinity, dry, wet, water activity, all kinds of parameters that extremophile researchers think about and go find the most extreme example on Earth and presto, change it most of the time, there's, there's life there. So that's why this yellow circle has increased and that's why the likelihood of them overlapping here is getting bigger. I know that's... Not very quantitative, but anyway. Here's a little bit more quantitative. On Earth, there are places where there are lots and lots of life, and there are places where there's not much at all. So that should give us a hint about what is, what do we mean by habitable? More life there is, I guess, the more habitable it is. So here we have a water desert. We're all used to this deserts. So here's a desert here and a desert here, and there's not that much life there. Temperature deserts down here and down up here, the nitrate deserts in these uh, mid-oceanic gyres here, there's not much nitrate. That's because the winds go like this, and any kind of dust particles are not carried into these regions, and therefore there's no nitrate and no life, because that life out there apparently hasn't figured out how to pull down nitrogen out of the atmosphere. Anyway, the same thing with iron. You need, when ships go here and they spread out iron, boom, lots more life. So there's some type of iron bottleneck. These are experiments that are being done by biologists all over the world to try to figure out, well, where are the more habitable places on Earth? What, is, what are the bottlenecks? Why isn't there life here? It's kind of like playing with fertilizer if you're a farmer, but you're doing it on the whole Earth. Okay, so one thing about the habitable zone of the Earth is that it's very, very narrow, six kilometers compared to 6,000. So if here's the radius of the Earth, then one millimeter is where we live and where all life lives. Uh, and now I wanted to switch gears a little bit and show you what a galaxy is. And here's some galaxies. And here's, let's pretend that this is our galaxy. Here's the center where we've got this three 
million solar mass black hole. Here's the sun at about eight kiloparsecs. Kiloparsec is a thousand parsecs. A parsec is about 3.26 light years. And uh, if you look at that from the side where we can see, you know, this cannot be our galaxy because we've never had a spaceship that lived, left the galaxy. But this is a picture of our galaxy. And so here's we look towards the galaxy. Over here is right here. Behind me is right here and right here. This is the anti-center. And then over there is that point there. So this is a real picture from the COBE satellite. And uh, so with that, we can ask the question, what about the galactic, are there regions of the galaxy that are more suitable for life? And a few years ago, we wrote a paper on the galactic habitable zone. And so this is galactocentric radius, how far you are from the center of the galaxy. So zero is over here. Here's where that big black hole is. And here's time. Our galaxy formed about 12 billion years ago. And then here's today. So this is a space-time diagram. And in the beginning of the galaxy, we had lots and lots of supernova going off here. These supernova produced the metals that we were talking about earlier that were needed to, to make Earth-like planets. But there are too many here, so it's kind of dangerous. You don't want to live here. Out here, there are not enough metals to make an Earth. But this goes boom, 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 and the metals slowly spread out across the galaxy. And then you have enough here, and you're far enough away from supernova so that you're not threatened by nearby supernova. And then we have a two-metal rich. The idea here was that if you have a very metal-rich star, you're much more likely to have a hot Jupiter, which has migrated or been scattered into the interior part of the, the, uh, its planetary system, in which case you may have destroyed the Earths. Uh, and then uh, here is too little time. There's not enough time. Remember, this is a plot for complex life. Now, uh, so there are four factors, the number of stars, the metallicity, supernova safe, and just time. And when you plot this probability distribution on one dimension in time, then you get this and the sun, 75% of the habitable stars are down here and 25 are up there. So again, the sun is kind of an old, it's a, it's a relatively new thing. Now, I should say this is the, this paper here and in the title is the word complex. I don't like, I, I kind of regret having used the word complex. I don't like that word, but so let me make amends here. Uh, but if you take away the need for four billion years to be complex, then this is the, the diagram that you get. In other words, you don't have any time requirement because you would just assume, oh, microbes, they can evolve in you know, 10, 100 billion years. We don't need four billion. I'm taking a breath. <laughs> okay, so now here's... Here's a tree, this is a hug tree. Carlos showed this in his talk the other day at the school. And, uh, and I, afterwards I said, Carlos, point out please that there are now only two domains. For 30 years, astrobiologists have promulgated the idea that there are three domains of life. And I think that's just, just crazy. It doesn't make any sense anymore because we know that we eukaryotes are now embedded in what are called the tack part of the archaea. So consider yourself an archaea, welcome home, Forget this as a separate uh, domain. It just should be removed. I know I love Carl Woese too, but this is just the new data. We are in Archaea, and this is our branching. And it would be a little bit more obvious if they took some of these branches and put them back and forth and back and forth, so it looks like we were more embedded in the Archaea, but they didn't do that. They should have. Okay, so we, what type of eukaryote are we? We are an opisticont. If you're not familiar with that term, that means we animals and fungi. We're all in the group called epistacons. So what are epistacons? Epistacons are right here. Epistacons are right here. And here, here the, here's where animals and fungi split about 1.2 billion years ago. This in yellow here are the, uh, are the vertebrates. So let's take a look at those. Here are the vertebrates. So we go from this tree to epistacons. Epistacons are right here. Epistacons have vertebrates in them. And here are all the vertebrates. And here we are. We're a mammal. So when you use the word complex. I mean, what physicists use is they throw this word around. Look at the biology, please, and then tell me, where did it become complex? Is a mouse complex? Usually people say, oh, people are complex and everything else in the universe is not. And I just have been fighting that for a long time. Uh, now let's look at the Drake equation. So here's the Drake equation. And what I pointed out earlier was there are no astro-based bottlenecks. You know, we have the number of detected civilizations seems to be zero. 
Why is it zero? Why haven't we detected this? This is Fermi's paradox. So in terms of the rate of star formation and the fraction of stars with planets, which I just told you was one, and the number which have Earth-like planets, which is, oh, probably some significant number, maybe 0.1 or 0.05 or maybe 0.3 or something. Anyway, this is a, a number that we have pretty good uh, hold on, and thanks to the recent research in planetary science. But this is like the fraction of those Earths which have life on them, the fraction of that life that is intelligent, the fraction of that intelligent life that wants to communicate or can communicate, the lifetime of the civilization that we're thinking about. And then I put in an extra factor for Seth Shostak because he thinks that uh, we're limited by our technology. So emergence. So this is like an emergence bottleneck. Here we have a human intelligence bottleneck. Here we have self-destruction bottleneck. And here's the technological bottleneck. And I should move a little faster because I'm running out of time. What I wanted to point out that this, this, bottle, this emergence of life, this life term could be divided into two. The probability of life emerging, but also the probability of that emerging life persisting. And that is not obvious, and that's why we wrote a paper uh, this year called the Guy and Bottleneck paper. So let me introduce, that's uh, this one here, the case for Guy and Bottleneck, the biology of habitability. So basically, here's some concepts to work with. Imagine that this square here represents all the types of habitable conditions and uninhabitable conditions. Here are the habitable conditions, and here are the planetary conditions, and here's what the conditions you need to start life. If there's no evolution, then poop. If this doesn't overlap with what you need to start life, then you, know, you, could, uh, you don't get any life. But let's suppose that you have planetary evolution, and so then you can start out in habitable conditions and then move away. And that's what's called the emergence bottleneck. Their life didn't emerge on that planet. But now let's talk about Gaian regulation. Here we have a planetary environment that's overlapping with what you need to start life, but then the planet e uh, evolves and then poop, you go extinct. And you don't have a way to stabilize the evolution of the, planet, of the planetary environments. And if you have a Gaian regulation, then you can kind of, oh, wait a minute, I want to be over there. I want to be over in this habitable region. And to the extent that you can have biology regulating a planetary surface environment, that's why you have this. But then, of course, the sun gets brighter and brighter and brighter, and off you go. You're dead. That'll happen to us in about a billion years. Okay, so circumstellar habitable zone. Here's the circumstellar habitable. You can see, get the picture. Here's what the evolution of it will be. And then this is an interesting plot, a lot of details, but kind of summarize this idea of a Gaian bottleneck. So here is the accretion rate. So boom, 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 planet accretes, planet accretes, and then the rate goes down, and here we are today at four and a half billion years, and here's a billion years later. Now, here's the distance from the star, and this is, what, this, this is an interesting point. Hart, in 1979, calculated a habitable zone before invoking the silicate carbonate cycle in 1981 that Walker came up with. So there was no abiotic stability for Hart. When he did that, you, he got, oh, the habitable zone in the solar system is 0.95 to 1.01 AU. When you read that paper, you say, what the hell is he talking about? That's ridiculous. He, he, ha he fudged the numbers, he cheated so he could have a habitable zone where the Earth is. I can think of no other reason for that. But that's what we do sometimes if we want to put the Earth in the habitable zone, and that's what he did. But he didn't have to take advantage of this carbonate silicate regulation. When you do that, that makes these things blow up here. And so here's Kaparapu, 2013. And uh, it gets much bigger, and of course it gets higher here because the sun is evolving. But I think, we think in this paper, we defend the idea that biology probably has more to do with habitability than we physicists have been giving credit. In other words, biology is not some passive thing that just sits there and say, oh, I'm lucky, I'm in a habitable zone, I can stay here. I suspect that the planetary surface environment, because of positive feedback, can easily go runaway greenhouse or runaway ice house. And that maybe, oh, for example, here we have planets that start here, boom, boom. The, 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 this is the mean surface temperature. Lots of impacts make it go cold and hot and cold and hot and cold and hot. And then we're, what we're saying is that this is unstable. There is no real habitable zone that, people have been, that physicists have been talking about because they completely ignore the effect of life here. And so 
maybe most planets just go vroom, just ice gets get too cold, get too hot, and there is no stable region here. There is no stable habitable zone, but occasionally life can evolve to figure out how to regulate the feedback mechanisms that are there to create a negative feedback mechanism that can keep you there. But then again, in a billion years, poop, we go lose because there are some limits to what life can do. So this is the Walker 1981 paper that introduced this abiotic thermal regulation that everybody since then has used. The reason why I don't think that's right is because it requires subaerial erosion to maintain the temperature. You need a temperature sensitive uh, weathering and then taking that calcium carbonate, taking it out of the atmosphere. And that rate is temperature sensitive and that's at the heart of the uh, thermal, the positive, the negative feedback. So here's some, uh, here's some feedback loops. Over here the positive ones that are very strong and are probably responsible for creating the instability that makes any habitable zone non-existent, but if perchance you have some type, you evolve somehow a negative feedback loop, that is when you can talk about a habitable zone, but it might be that biology plays the dominant role in creating these negative feedbacks, not abiotic mechanisms. And if that's the case, then we are in a situation where almost all planets go boom, Zoom, and only rarely do you do this, and that's why we call it the Gaian bottleneck, because you need a kind to invoke a type of Gaian regulation to maintain this temperature, and non-life will not do it for you. So, is planetary habitability more constrained by physics or biology? I'm guessing that we physicists need to consider we need a lot of more help from biologists, particularly ones who are looking at the global regulation of CO2 in the carbonate silicate cycle to figure out how much and how big a role life played and at what stage in the evolution of life on Earth were, was it able to be so global that it could do this, changing the albedo, et cetera. So as we learn more and think more about the habitable zone, we realize the biggest uncertainty is not clouds, it is life itself. What does life do? What can life do? How far can selection go to produce life forms that can control their environments very early on when that environment hasn't gone, run away, or lost its water? Cars don't stay on roads without drivers. Planets don't stay habitable without life. That's the idea. Might be right. So here's a planet, here's some life trying to stay on it, and boom, it falls off. And this is the extinction, the default for planetary life in the universe. If you know anything about life at all, you know that most of it has gone extinct. This should not surprise you. So it shouldn't surprise you that even if you get life started on a planet, that it goes extinct 90%, 99%, 99.9%, I don't know what the number is, but it's a possibility that we haven't considered very much. And when you're doing these, hey, get the luminosity of the, the Earth on this thing, it's in the habitable zone, think twice about your ignorance or your, your negligence of the effect of biology on that planet, and maybe that's what's required to be habitable. So essentially, this is what the usual view is, and this is what the might be the case. Instead of having a stable habitable zone, we have an unstable one. And anything else? It may, this model makes some predictions, and this prediction is, <coughs> excuse me, in the guy and bottleneck model, here's the fraction of initially wet rocky planets near the circumstellar habitable zone with life. And so maybe life, is, maybe life starts all over the place, but then it goes extinct. If that's the case, then we should find lots of planets with extinct microbial life but very few with microbes and dinosaur bones and advanced life because it, most of the time, it goes extinct. And so instead of this picture, this might be the default.